Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And as far as my CV goes, that's about it, to be honest. So um, we'll move on. And what I'm going to very briefly talk to you about, I'm not going to spend a long time because I'm going to teach you, well, not, not teach you, just inform you about the different types of repair that are available and what evidence there is that either one of these repairs should be undertaken. And then naturally, you know, this is 2015. We are entering into a keyhole or minimal access era. I'm going to sort of describe the various minimal access techniques that are available, but mainly look at the evidence comparing open uh, and minimal access repair, and I'll leave you to decide which repair you would want to do on your patients. Um, but I can give you a general idea in terms of which repair is better for this patient. I'll try to come to some conclusion, um, and I'm not going to talk about mesh, and I'm not going to talk about complications, because my other uh, colleagues will discuss all of those. So what is an abdominal hernia? Um, well, so Ashley Cooper, as you know, described an abdominal hernia as an uh, abnormal protrusion of a viscous uh, through a defect in the abdominal wall. So Ashley Cooper, a famous British surgeon, or English surgeon, probably at the time, and he got his knighthood, I believe, because he removed an infected sebaceous cyst from King George the Fourth scalp, and it didn't recur. And uh, if I'm correct in understanding, he was the third surgeon to have done this. Obviously, getting a knighthood is a little bit more difficult nowadays, but it worked for him then. But he was very good at what he did. Um, incisional hernia is a common hernia. It's unsightly. Um, it occurs in a wide variety of uh, patients, especially those that have uh, comorbidities, the ones that we all try and avoid and palm off to our younger colleagues. Um, it is symptomatic. Uh, they generally require repair uh, for the majority of them. We've all seen those patients that actually have a large incisional hernia down to their knees, and it becomes very difficult to operate on these and repair them. And approximately 11% of all laparotomies that you perform um, will end up with an incisional hernia. So it is um, a topic which um, requires discussion and requires some sort of um, evidence-based practice in terms of what are you going to do to repair this. And why is it important? Because the recurrence still remains high. This is uh, just, uh, just showing you why incisional hernia recurrence is high. I mean, almost... Um, Within 40 uh, months, those that are going to recur, you get at least half the number of patients, and this is looking at primary repair of a component separation. And it's just an illustration to show you that incisional hernia are there, the recurrence is high, and even when you repair them, the recurrence risk is high. Um, but some repairs obviously have a higher recurrence rate than others. So what are the options for repair? We can just suture it back together. Primary repair um, is still done. In some circumstances, it is a reasonable choice. Um, autologous repair, component separation, uh, we'll talk about this in a moment, described by Ramirez in 1990. Um, and obviously mesh repairs, the different types of mesh, where you can put them. I'm not going to discuss biologics. Um, biologics is a very interesting topic, and there's no room for a discussion for that today. And combination repairs, you can do laparoscopic repair, and you can combine the laparoscopic with the open technique, which is called a hybrid repair. Um, so what do you consider in repair? You've got to look at the overlying skin and soft tissue. Make sure it's healthy. Um, if there's areas of skin necrosis, it's best... Uh, to involve one of our abdominal wall reconstruction surgeons, or call plastic surgeons, if you can drag them away from the other hospitals. Um, and naturally, you've got to have an idea about the fascia underlying. Look for infection. If there's infection present, it's best not to put in a mesh, uh, possibly looking at a primary repair. See where it is. Is it above the umbilicus, below, lateral? A location is very important, and the size of the hernia is important. And the choice, then you have to decide on the choice of reconstruction. Are you going to do a primary repair? Are you going to place a mesh? Um, or possibly look at an IPOM repair. The um, in international hernia uh, classification uh, for incisional hernias is present. It's rather um, uh, extreme, to say the least. I personally don't use it. I'm sure... Some colleagues do use it, but it's there for everyone to classify their hernias. And if you're doing them on a regular basis, I think you should document at least where it is, how big is it, if it's a recurrence, and whether you can reduce it, and if it's symptomatic. And I think it's reasonable to document that. You'd be surprised the number of things that patients like to get us on 
um, in other ways. The abdominal wall anatomy uh, is very important. Um, we've all got uh, an exam that tested us to extreme limits. Um, so we all should be aware of the abdominal wall anatomy, uh, especially uh, when you're going to operate on patients. Hernias up here, hepatobiliary surgeons, we tend to get a lot of incisional hernias up here. Um, so you have to know the anatomy in order to repair these. And again, the choice of surgery becomes important. And this is just another view showing the anatomy which we're all familiar with. But importantly, when you're deciding upon a repair, you should really have an idea or you must know that below, um, or just above the pubis, you really don't have any fascial layers. You just have extra peritoneal fat. And above it, you just have the external oblique aponeurosis. And in between, naturally, you've got the arcuate line. And above it, you've got the split of the rectus abdominis muscle. And this is a very nice plane that we try and use um, for our sublayer repairs. So this anatomy, again, uh, is very, very important, especially for the large incisional hernias. So looking at the defect, have an idea of what you're dealing with. A CAT scan is important. A large abdominal hernia, you really need to have a CAT scan. This will tell you the size of the hernia, where it is, and importantly, what it contains. The certain zones um, that are reasonable indicators in terms of the arterial supply uh, for the abdominal wall. So zone one is the mid-abdomen, mainly the deep epigastric arcades and the superior and inferior epigastric arteries will supply them. And zone two, you have a, 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 the lower abdomen, you have a, more arteries supplying, and don't forget the flanks where you've got the intercostal and lumbar arteries. These arteries become very important. Um, we're going to have a talk on complications later. Skin necrosis is a, is a big problem. And um, if you damage any of this blood supply, it makes it uh, very difficult. So the principles of repair it must be tension-free. Um, you need to prevent any underlying visceral exposure. Try and use the abdominal wall as much as possible if you can. Uh, and hopefully it will last uh, a long time. In terms of recurrence rates, it's reasonable to quote uh, a good 10% recurrence rate for incisional hernias. Um, those surgeons that never get in, uh, recurrences are the ones you probably shouldn't go to. So in terms of repairs, what we're going to discuss are the component separation, onlay, and the sublayer repair. These are the um, open repairs that are commonly seen. If you look at component separation, uh, the idea is, is to divide uh, the external uh, ob uh, ob lateral to the rectus muscle, the external oblique aponeurosis, and expose or basically allow the muscle or the external oblique aponeurosis to move across and what it does rely on is the fact that the dissection between the rectus abdominis muscle is quite easy, avoid damage in the neurovascular bundles, but it allows the maintenance of some blood supply. This gives you uh, the extra length that's required to really bring an uh, abdominal wall uh, closer together. So the rectus is easily separated, as I've explained, from the posterior sheath, and the neurovascular bundle uh, travels uh, on the deep surface of the internal oblique muscle, which again allows a good vascularization. So where can you use this technique under what circumstances? Up a third, up to about a 10 centimeter defect would be reasonable to use a Ramirez uh, uh, component separation technique, possibly for larger defects um, and smaller defects below. And that's because of the anatomy, which I described to you earlier um, for that reason. If you look at uh, recurrence rates for this type of operation that's been undertaken, um, generally it's quite good, but then you have some cases where the recurrence rate's quite high uh, for the primary or repair or using the Ramirez technique. But if you incorporate mesh as well, the recurrence rate reduces, as one paper cl clearly showed. Um, but naturally, the high-risk patients will remain your complicated obese diabetics with chronic obstructive AOS disease. So generally speaking, the, the results show that a Ramirez technique is good, recurrence rate, but if you combine it with a mesh, it will probably be better. Using a mesh, you can either put it on top, in between, or underneath. And this is a slightly better diagram showing, uh, again, the on-layer repair retro rectus or the preperitoneal repair. This one is probably umbilical hernias where you do the preperitoneal approach and the IPOM approach or the intraperitoneal repair. 
The on-ray repair was popularized by um, Chevrel, is really whereby you close the abdominal wall and you place a mesh uh, on top of, of the, um, the repair. And the in-ray repair is whereby the fascial edges, you really bridge um, the incisional hernia repair together. And, and if you look at on-lay versus sub-lay repair, the on-lay repair has been shown to have a higher wound complication rate possibly a higher recurrence rate. And um, the general recommendation is that possibly the sublay repair is better, but I know the users of the onlay repair, Andrew Kingsnorth is a big user of the onlay repair, he gets excellent results. So again, it points towards the fact that hernia is technique driven. What about the Reeves or stopper repair? Um, well, this is a sublay technique. Originally, um, it was described um, by Reeves uh, sorry, originally it was de described by Stopper in 1975 um, to repair large incisional hernias, especially bilateral recurrent groin hernia, hernias, where they create that space, that extra peritoneal plane, avoid going into the peritoneum, push everything back, and just place the mesh. Um, and there was no closure of the defect. It worked very well. Um, and it was generally described as a giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac. Um, and the mesh wasn't really sutured in place. There have been various modifications to this. Wantz described it uh, using it unilaterally rather than bilaterally. And again, there was no inferior securing of the mesh. So now we move on to uh, combination techniques, whereby you have your uh, uh, component separation, you move your... Um, rectus sheath across, try and close the gap, and you can place a mesh in the subleg technique. You can put an IPOM uh, mesh in or intraperitoneal mesh in a hybrid repair. But you really need to then look at various other types of rectus advancement uh, techniques that have been developed, such as the external oblique uh, release, lateral release, uh, anterior fascial release. And now we're using endoscopic component separation. Uh, this is an operation which is um, Really, I've seen quite a lot in the United States. A lot of surgeons are using it here. There are a few surgeons, there's a centre in Nottingham that's using it. It takes a long time. Uh, something that you can do um, in less than 20 minutes, open. I've seen surgeons um, undertake the surgery in more than two hours. But generally speaking, this is an advancement. This is something that's new, and it will take time um, to, to promote uh, this type of repair. So this is a type of uh, advance, advancement reconstruction whereby you're dividing posteriorly below the rectus sheet and then you're just bringing this all across like this and then you can place a mesh underneath here and if you look at the different types of uh, techniques that have been described obviously Ramirez, Shastak use the plane of separation uh, between the interface between the external oblique aponeurotic muscles and Mathis described the lateral release and in 1996 he described the anterior rectal fascial release and um, if you want to have a look at them in more detail. This slide here was kindly provided to me by Todd Henneford, who was the ex-president of the American Hernia Society. And it's, it's, it's a very nice slide because it shows um, which uh, releases have been described and the various techniques like the sliding door release, whereby if you look at one, you divide here the uh, gap between the internal and external oblique aponeurosis as laterally as you can go. Uh, and also you may do an anterior uh, fascial release and just sort of like pull, pull the whole thing across like this. Um, but again, experience counts. Whatever you wish um, to undertake is perfectly reasonable. But these are very good techniques, especially for large incisional hernias where we need to advance um, the abdominal wall right across. So the options with open remain primary repair, Ramirez, obviously advancement techniques, I feel that mesh is probably necessary now in most of these techniques. Um, there's enough studies that have shown that just the Ramirez on its own without mesh, probably the recurrence rate is slightly higher. Um, you have to be wary of stomas that are present and fistulas. The minimal access approach, there are two or three uh, small incisions. You can repair a hernia. Uh, there's less post-operative pain, gives you a quicker recovery. 
Um, although the, some evidence says there's less post-operative pain, I'm yet to see uh, an, uh, an IPOM repair that I've undertaken where they're not uh, in a reasonable degree of pain following surgery. They say the home, the patients can go home in the same, the same day, but again, for the small ones, possibly um, the two to four days is reasonable. But yes, they can get quicker back to work. Um, does it have a net positive effect on the economy? I'm not sure. So the laparoscopic repair of an incisional hernia, it's relatively new, but a lot more operations are being done with this technique. Um, the mesh is placed, um, clips are applied in order to stop the mesh um, in a double crown technique, from stop the mesh from really just um, caving in with the, the repair. But now uh, fascial closure is, is the main technique which is used in order to reduce the defects and reduce the risk of seroma formation. Uh, how would you compare laparoscopic reopen? Um, in this uh, study, looking at eight uh, papers, the average length of stay was shorter, and this is the main uh, fact that I'd like to uh, point out here. Uh, further analyses have identified again that the mean length of stay was shorter after laparoscopic repair. We'll be looking at five days over 10 days. As you can see, daily discharge or day case surgery, uh, an IPOM repair, I don't believe is uh, um, one for uh, day case surgery, and I'd be interested to hear anyone's thoughts on that. Um, further evidence um, shows that uh, the IPOM repair is comparable to an open repair. Um, however, there are very high in-hospital costs uh, which are associated. Um, but another consistent finding uh, with all the meta-analyses was the fact that it does reduce the risk of wound infection. And uh, I would have to agree with that statement. It's, but in terms of pain, possibly not. Hospital costs, again, possibly not, especially if you're looking at reduced hospital stay. Um, but it's very important to know that never events. And if you do the open repair, you can get a never event, small bowel injury, fistulas. But for keyhole surgery, those events were slightly higher. So the short-term results for laparoscopic um, ventral or incisional hernia surgery are reasonably promising. <clears throat> um, another large meta-analysis compared laparoscopic reopen, and it showed that the reoperation rate was, was comparable, and also the length of hospital stay was good. So the, the, uh, the idea is you have a defect, and you place the mesh, and over here you've got costal margin fixation, which can be a bit of a problem, so you'd have to put your tax in. And um, I tend to use fiber and sealant to secure the mesh underneath there, and that way it allows better ingrowth and uh, better repair. But some, if it's over the liver, some uh, colleagues of mine just let it rest over the, um, over the um, uh, liver and, and, it's, and it seems to work quite fine. So in terms of the choice of repair, up to 10 centimeters I think is suitable for laparoscopic repair and there's good evidence to show that too. 10 to 15 centimeters are, are suitable for either, but you may elect to repair this via the open technique. Um, greater than 20 centimeters, I think some sort of rectus advancement technique is probably warranted. Uh, there's good evidence to show that this will help bring the uh, uh, abdominal wall closer. And if you remember from my earlier slides, using the abdominal wall and its tissue integrity in itself is a good idea. Always try and use the abdominal wall as much as you can. Anything larger, um, again, um, the advancement techniques are probably reasonable using uh, component separation. So that's a general guide and based on the evidence, this is what um, we try and achieve. So the choice of pair will depend on the loss of do domain. On the right side, there's an ob obligatory decrease in the circumference of the abdominal girdle. So it's always difficult to just try and bring everything across. You must look at the blood supply, the neurovascular bundles, and you must examine the tissue, via, tissue quality that you have um, available. <clears throat> and obviously when you push everything back in, they may not breathe afterwards, so that's also something that you should be aware of. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, reconstruction requires complex and creative planning. 
The choice of repair is generally operator dependent and there isn't really research to say this is the repair you must do. But many types of abdominal wall mobilisation have been described and the choice is yours and familiarity and knowledge of the uh, rectus sheath and abdominal wall anatomy becomes key and important. Sublayer appears to be the preferred place where you apply the mesh. Uh, but morbidity is apparent and you must be aware that recurrence is always possible. So this is something that you need to turn into this and um, I can always tell you later what technique I use, these holes might give it away. And so in conclusion, hernia surgery will remain operator dependent. There are various techniques that are available that you can use. Um, familiarity of the anatomy is important. And the minimal access repair has a role and place. Um, I believe that it should be um, undertaken with care and caution. I'd like to thank the ASGBI uh, and my co-speakers um, for this um, event and thank you all for coming and I'll leave you with this. Thank you very much.